Good morning. Welcome to Bayside again. Glad that you're here today. Uh, glad that you've joined us for worship. Uh, before we get into our sermon this morning, uh, well, I got a quiz for you. The, the youth group, we, we like to do quizzes, so if you're in our youth group, you know about this. But for those of you who don't, don't worry, don't get nervous. Um, you're not going to be graded. Uh, you won't be looked down upon. But are you ready? Because last week, the congregation, I don't know, there's... It was a little disappointing, so let's see. I'm gonna, not, not everybody is accountable here, but if you've been here for a while, like for this year, you're in trouble if you don't know the answer, right? This year, in 2014, our church is focusing on? Very good. All right. Good job. You guys passed the test. Uh, now, some of you are probably like, boy, I didn't say anything, but I'm glad everyone else knew that answer. So, um, and here's our, our mission, our vision. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this is something that in the last couple of years we've been putting out, uh, and, and it's twofold. Our mission uh, here at Bayside is, is two-parted. It's making disciples, which is the upper half, and then loving the least of these. And, and this, is, this comes straight from Jesus Christ. We believe that these were the two most important things that he was doing on the earth, was making disciples and loving the least of these as he brought honor and glory to his Father. And that was pretty much his mission and purpose. And so that's what our mission is here at Bayside. And in the loving the least of these, uh, brokenness is actually right here in these red boxes. And that's our focus for 2014. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, our focus for last year, 2013, was our, our food shelf and garden ministry. And it was kind of exciting last year to start up this, this new ministry. Uh, if you don't know about it, you can pull your car in the parking lot around to this side, the, the what side is that, east, west? I don't even know. West side, thank you for the directionally non-challenged people. The west side, there's a garden out there. It's fenced in and you can see it. And uh, pretty soon, uh, once it starts uh, feeling like the normal spring weather, we'll uh, actually start doing some gardening there. Uh, but we're very excited to have the second year of the garden ministry getting underway. Uh, and it is much more than just growing fresh vegetables. Uh, it's a tool to share God's love, okay? So we want you to be involved in that. We want you to be a part of that. We had many people who last year were a part of the garden, and even though we've had this really long winter, like same type of thing happened last year. In fact, it snowed in May last year, and like every weekend it was raining, and they got a slow start to the garden, but at the end of the season, when it came time for harvest, it was an unbelievable uh, amount of harvest and produce that came out of it. So it was really exciting. Uh, there's a couple ways that you can get involved. Number one, we have a work day this Saturday. And so if you want to just come and check it out and see what goes on with the garden, uh, this Saturday uh, from 9 a.m. till noon, this Saturday, May 17th, uh, for anyone and everyone, there's going to be a job for you. Uh, it doesn't matter if you can lift heavy things or if you just want to shovel or whatever. Just There's going to be lots of opportunity for you to work. So come and join us this Saturday, the 17th, from 9 a.m. to noon. Another way that you can be part of it is to become a garden team member, okay? Uh, the, you can garden alongside a community member throughout the summer, sharing the love of Jesus while getting to know that community member. So what we do is we have these plots, and we offer those up to people in our community uh, who are in need or who just want to come and, and do a garden. And then somebody from Bayside will kind of work with them in that garden and just spend some time with them, share the love of Jesus with them, and just work the garden with them. So if you want to do that, that's one way you can get involved. Uh, a third way is to recruit community members. We, we want to fill that up with people from our community who are being blessed by this garden. So we're looking for people who need Jesus, who are in need, and who are from our community. Although you don't need to be all three of those, just somebody who would you think might be interested in that. Uh, we would need your help in recruiting them. Get the information to them and get their information to us if you think that you have somebody that might be interested in that. Or if you would be interested in that. Uh, so for more information, obviously you can contact our church office. If you didn't already fill out your connection card, you can let us know on the connection card. Um, also, we'll have a table in the fellowship hall. Uh, there will be a garden table after the service. Uh, and so you can stop by the table in the fellowship hall and ask more questions and find out more information. And above all else, if you don't know who to contact, uh, Sherry Breen will be the one who's kind of the go-to person on the garden ministry. So you can contact her uh, if you have any questions. So. We are very excited to start this up. I know it's still, although yesterday was nice, but up until yesterday, it still felt like February and March, uh, and then it'll probably come back again this week. We'll be, you know, raining and cold all week long, uh, but hopefully by Saturday, it'll feel like May, and we'll start up with our work day on Saturday, so we'd love to have you join us. So uh, again, that's the, the garden ministry for 
2014, just getting started. Well, Pastor Mark is once again uh, not here this week, as you can tell. Uh, he's still on vacation. He'll be back next week, I promise. So if you're like super disappointed that you walked in and you saw that I was here, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't do anything about it, though, okay? You're stuck with me. I like, I like saying that, but it's not funny. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Kidding me every time. All right. Well, uh, again, like I mentioned, though, this year we're focusing on brokenness. But before I do that, actually, I love to share pictures of my life and my family. I've done that before. You guys know that. And so I've shared pictures of my family, my kids, my wife, and my three wonderful boys. I've got three boys. Uh, and all that. But, and I've even shared a picture of my dog with you guys. Uh, and that's always fun. Do dog people love it. People who don't like dogs are, eh, whatever. Um, but at least it's not a cat, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Cat people, I love you. I had a cat growing up, but not anymore. Not as an adult. There's no way. I know why my parents will only let us get one. Okay. Um, but I wanted to show you guys a picture, actually, of my house. Uh, I've showed my, my, my family, my kids, and there's my house. That's where I live. Uh, beautiful home, white picket fence. The American dream, right? Two and a half kids. I actually have three kids. Uh, but there it is. It's a, it's a beautiful home. And so that's, that's where we live. And it's, it's just good to have a home here in Superior. And, and you know what? That's a house. But, but our home, too, is here. This is my home away from home. In fact, I probably spend more time here than I do at that house. Sometimes it feels like. I'm sure my wife would agree with that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome to call this home here at Bayside and call Superior home. Uh, we are blessed. Uh, and, and so I'm thankful to be able to share pictures of my family and my life. And so there's my house. Um, again, like I said, uh, we are focusing on brokenness in 2014. And uh, we have this challenge this year, throughout the, the year, every month, it's called the Let's Live It Challenge. And so if you didn't receive one of these, uh, we have these little hanger things that are, they're at the info table in the back. Uh, you can grab one, but every month we've had one of these out, uh, and an opportunity for you to live out your faith through different challenges that we're focusing on under brokenness this year. Okay, and so we're challenging you to pray, number one, to pray for the persecuted church. We're praying for all the most persecuted nations in the world, and we're going right through the top persecuted nations in the world. This week, we're asking you to pray for the country of Laos, okay? And then we're, we're wanting to get God's word in us, and so we're, we're memorizing God's word, or we're just reading it, or we're getting out in front of us, and we're putting it out in places where we'll see it, and that's why this is here. It's got this verse here for this month. Uh, that we can read together. And so if you can put this somewhere where you remember it, put it in your car or on the mirror. So in the morning when you wake up and you're getting yourself ready for the morning, you know, doing your hair or whatever you got to do, um, you can read it. And then there's one simple action uh, to reach out to someone who is physically broken. And so these are our challenges for the month of May. Uh, but what I want to do this morning, once again, we did this last week, so I want to read through this verse. And so if we can pull up Isaiah 58, 11, um, is, is the verse for this month, and you can read along with me uh, as we just kind of, again, want to focus on this verse this month. And last week and this week, we'll really be focusing in on this verse. Um, and I think it says a lot to us, and it's an encouragement to us uh, in our brokenness that, that God is still with us in all that. So let's read this together, Isaiah 58, 11. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. Whose waters do not fail. The, the, the context of this verse, again, we talked about this last week, but I'm going to kind of just do a quick review uh, of last week. The context of this verse is that the Israelites in the Old Testament kind of were, were wishy-washy. They were back and forth. In one moment, you'd read this story of how they had turned to the Lord and they were following God. And then the next moment, they would turn away and they would fall away from him and they would fall into the ways of the world. And this was the pattern in the Old Testament of, of the Israelites. And so they would return to God, but then fall away. And, and Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is calling to them, telling them, come back to the Lord, return to God fast and pray, come back to the Lord. And when you do that, there's some rewards that God blesses us with. And that's what this verse is all about. And so last week, we, we talked about three great things that God promises when we return to him. Number one is that God will guide you. God will guide you. It says, and the Lord will guide you continually. 
Uh, Psalm 23, 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. God promises to lead us when we return to him. Another verse we looked at was Psalm 73, 24. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. God gives us wisdom and counsel when we look to him, when we return to him. And then we talked about Jesus sharing with his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 13. And he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. That was Jesus promising the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and then later on promising the Holy Spirit to every person who puts their faith in Jesus. When we trust in Jesus, he blesses us with the Holy Spirit to guide us. This is an amazing promise and blessing. When we return to him, God will guide us. So that was the first promise from this verse in Isaiah 58, 11, that God will guide you. The second is that God will satisfy you. It says, and, his, and satisfy your desire in scorched places. The NIV says needs, so he'll satisfy your desires and your needs. Psalm 107, 9 says, For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. When we long for Jesus, when we're hungry for God, he satisfies us. He will satisfy us even in the scorched places and the dry lands, during down times, during droughts, even in the lowest of our low, God satisfies our everything. And then again, Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 13, continuing to talk to his disciples, says, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. When we trust in Jesus, his joy fulfills us. It satisfies when we put our trust and our hope in Jesus. So again, the first point, the first promise that God gives us in this verse in Isaiah 58, 11, is that God will guide you. And the second is that God will satisfy you. The third is that God will strengthen you. God will strengthen you. In the NIV version, we have it up here on the screen, it says, Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. And will strengthen your frame. And so this is kind of where we were at when we left off last week. He will strengthen your frame. And so the ESV says he will make your bones strong. And the NIV says he will strengthen your frame. So what is your frame? What is your frame? Your frame is, well, your bones, your essence, your substance, your life. This is your frame. It's who you are. It's your identity. Your frame is your identity. When we return to God, when we trust in Jesus, Jesus Christ is our foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Even though we are broken, even though we are sinful, even though we are hurting, even though sometimes we may be lost, God can build us back up. And it starts with a foundation in Jesus Christ. He has built us a foundation. And also, he has framed us. We have been made complete. And in Jesus Christ, we are made complete. And so, you have been framed. God promises that he has framed you. He has strengthened your frame. And, and as, I, I, as I prayed and studied this, I got to thinking about what does that mean? What does it mean to be framed? What does it mean to have a good frame? And, and last week I talked a little bit about this, that uh, when, when building a house, you have to build a good, solid frame. And some of you that are in construction uh, know this and have done this, and if you don't have a good frame or a good foundation, that house is not going to last, okay? A good foundation, a solid foundation, and a good frame. And so I started thinking about what does a good frame look like? <coughs> And I did some studying and some research, and I want to show you guys uh, a, a house. There was a house that was built in 1884, and, and there's a picture of this house right here. This picture uh, is actually was taken in 1946, 
And so this house right here is 62 years old in that picture. And, and this, this house was built in 1884. And have you ever heard somebody say, or have you ever said, they don't build them like they used to? Wow, nobody's ever heard that before? Okay, a couple people are laughing, right? Maybe you're not laughing because you've said that. They don't build them like they used to, right, Bob? Am I right? They don't. They don't build them like they used to. This house was built in 1884. That picture was uh, taken in 1946, 62 years old. The next picture that we have, same house, 1961. This house is 77 years old. Look at that frame, still solid as a rock, still good foundation. Next picture, 1972, 88 years old. This house, 88 years old, still solid frame. It was built in 1884. The next picture, 1984, 100 years old. There that house still stands, 100 years old. Next picture, 2007, one year after I purchased this same house, 123 years old. And then the next picture is the picture that I took last Friday of that same exact house, 130 years old, same house. It amazes me when I go into my basement and I look at the structure of this house, the beams in the bottom of that house. And when I look at different parts of the house, we resided the house a couple of years ago and I could see the frame of this house. That's a strong frame. They don't build them like they used to. 130 years ago, that house was built here in Superior, Wisconsin, and it's still standing today. That, my friends, is a strong frame. God has strengthened your frame. God has strengthened your frame. Again, as I studied and prayed about frames and bones and life and our essence, it brought me back to Jesus. It brought me back to Jesus. And last week we, we took communion and we just focused and, and put our hearts towards Jesus. And I asked a question last week. I asked a question that God led me to as I studied for this sermon. Why was it that Jesus' bones were not broken? You see, Jesus lived a life here on earth. He lived the perfect life. And he died on the cross for our sins, as a payment for our sins, to give us redemption, to heal us of our brokenness. But in the process of his death, in the process of being beaten, and scourged and whipped and bloodied and killed on a cross, his bones were not broken. Why is that? And is there anything significant to that? And that's what I asked last week, and, and a few people actually throughout this week were contacting me and asking me, maybe guessing a little bit about why, why that was. And I, I promised today that I would kind of at least tell you what I've been led to and what God's led me to in this. And, and so I want to do that today. Again, going back to the Isaiah 58, 11, it says in the ESV his, uh, that, that I will make your bones strong. The NIV says I will strengthen your frame. Both, comes, both of these words come from the same word that's found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Genesis 2, 23 says... Then the man, Adam, said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is when Adam first saw Eve, when God had created Eve out of Adam. He said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He was talking about her frame. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30 tells us because we are members of his body. We are members of his body, talking about Jesus Christ. John 19, 36 explains the first part of the reason why I believe that Jesus Christ's bones were not broken. Okay, when, when Jesus was on the cross, he's hanging on the cross and he's dying there. And the soldiers are, are getting ready to you know, move on in the process. And what they would do back then, in those days when they hung somebody from a cross, to speed up the process, they would literally break the legs of the person hanging on the cross so that it would help them to die quicker. 
Okay? And when they came to Jesus to do this, they, they broke the legs of the, the two people that were on the crosses next to him, and they come to Jesus to do the same thing, he was already dead. And so there was no reason for them to break his bones. And in John chapter 19, verse 36, it says, For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Not one of his bones will be broken. The first reason Jesus' bones were not broken was to fulfill prophecy. The prophecy from the Old Testament that said his bones will not be broken. Thousands of years before Jesus came to the earth, people proclaimed, the prophets proclaimed, that his bones would not be broken, but that he would be killed, that he would die on the cross, that he would die for us. And if you remember, if you were here at Bayside during the Easter season, we talked about the Passover lamb. Do you remember that? Pastor Mark was preaching about the Passover lamb and how for thousands of years prior to Christ's coming, they celebrated the Passover lamb, which was killed to save them from being killed. The very first Passover in Exodus. And then every year after that, the Israelite people celebrated the Passover and how God spared them because they had sacrificed this lamb. And then one day Jesus came and became that Passover lamb and spared us death by going to die on the cross. But his bones were not broken. And in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, as God is telling them what to do with the Passover lamb and how to, how to prepare it for the very first Passover, it says, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Again, literally predicting the future that Jesus' bones would not be broken. The Passover lamb, thousands of years prior to Christ, who would be the fulfilled Passover lamb. It was also predicted by King David, who was an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Jesus was to be born in the prophecy, in the line of King David. That was part of the prophecy. And King David, in Psalm 34, 20, says, He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Not one of them is broken. Again, Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled because Jesus' bones were not broken. This was predicted thousands of years before Jesus even came to life and before he went to die. Interesting thing, King David also wrote about his frame in another psalm, one that you might be familiar with, Psalm 139. It says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Talking about when God creates us, he creates our frame. It's not hidden from God. God loves us. God has strengthened our frame. This is just another verse of Scripture that shows us the importance of our frame, of our identity, of who we are. So yes, prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus' bones not being broken. But that wasn't all. That wasn't all. Bones, flesh, frame, Body. I want to go back to Ephesians 5.30. Ephesians 5.30. It says, we are members of his body. We are members of his body. In the Bible, God has made it very clear that the church is the body of Christ. Have you heard that before? We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the bones of Christ. We are the frame of Christ. God's word clearly tells us this. The church, when we are united together in the name of Jesus Christ, we are his body. We are his flesh. We are his bones. We are his frame. So why is it so important that his bones were not broken? It's the symbolism. The answer lies in the integrity of his body, the very people of God who are his body, 
his bones, his frame, the church. Because when we are united in Jesus Christ, we are not broken. Every one of us individually is broken. We're sinful. We're hurting. We're broken. We've established that. And if you haven't been here up until today in this church this year, you've now heard it. You're broken. I'm broken. Pastor Mark's broken. Everyone in here is broken. But when we come together in unity, in the church, we are not broken. Do you see the symbolism? Do you see the importance that Jesus' bones, his flesh, his frame was not broken? God's intention is that Christ's church remain unbroken. It is not God's will that the body of Christ be broken apart. If God went to so far lengths to make sure that Jesus, is Christ, Jesus Christ's bones were not broken, think about how much he cares about the church not being broken. And yet how many churches seem broken, seem messed up, seem sinful? It is God's will that the body of believers be unified, be of one mind. When we have unity in the church, there's nothing that can stop us as a church. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 18, that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus himself declared that. When we are united as a body of believers in Jesus Christ, we will not be broken, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. God has given us this great symbol that when we are in Christ, we are healed. And so I guess my challenge and my encouragement and, and, and what I want you to get out of this today is the importance of unity in the church. And maybe you just need to get it into your head, the importance of church. In America, we have lost the importance of the church. Everything else is more important than the church in our lives. The church is a byproduct of our lives, and God bless you. I know sometimes I may be preaching to the choir here because you are all in church this morning. I get it. But I know I myself have been lazy when it comes to church. And I put other things before I put my church. We put everything before church. If something comes up on a Sunday that's more important, we're going to go do that than we're, before we go to church. And I'm not pointing the finger at all of you and, and us as Bayside. And, and it's me. It's, it's our country. It's our human nature. It's our culture. But think about that. If God went to such great lengths to not only have this prophecy of Christ's bones not being broken, but for it to actually come true and happen, and then the symbolism that we are the body of Christ, and when we are united, we are not broken. How powerful that is when we come together in unity, and when we do not take for granted the church, and when we take it seriously, and when we put it in our lives as an important part of our lives. This is the amazing thing. When we are one, when we are unified in Jesus Christ, we are the body of Christ. And we are not broken. I want to go back to Isaiah 58, 11. There's one more promise that I wanted to share. If we can pull up Isaiah 58, 11 again. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. God promises that he will make us like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Our waters will not fail because God will not fail us. God will not fail us. The last promise is God will not fail you. When we are thirsty for the waters from God, he will overflow us 
like a spring of water, like a water garden, and he will not fail us. Psalm 73, verse 26. It says this, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see, we will fail. We will fail. Others will fail us. Have you experienced that before? (laughs) I know I have. Others will fail us. But God does not fail us. He gives us strength. Zephaniah 3.5, another verse that tells us that God will not fail us. It says, The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. Every morning, each dawn, he does not fail. His mercies are new every morning. God will not fail you. In 2014, as a church, our theme has been brokenness. Brokenness. And you may have gotten tired of hearing that. (laughs) But there's a reason why we are continuing to go back there. We've realized that we're broken. We've explored God's word. We found healing in Jesus Christ. And we are united together as the body of Jesus Christ, as the church. You see, Jesus' bones were not broken. And we are not broken. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. You may be broken today. And maybe you'll find yourself broken a month from now, or five years from now. But God will guide you. God will satisfy you. God will strengthen you. And God will not fail you. That's a promise. You've been framed. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning and we celebrate you, Lord. We worship you, God. We glorify your name, Lord. We give you praise. For Lord, you have promised us so many good things. God, you have promised us everything we would ever need or desire. God, you will guide us. You will satisfy us. You will strengthen us. You will not fail us. And we proclaim that today. We thank you, Lord, so much for your word, the promises in your word, and how it gives us hope. Lord, I pray that today, If any one of us in here are feeling low or like we're in a dry place, a scorched land, a drought, far from you, God, I pray that we would come back to you, that we would return to you, Lord, and that you would bless us with these promises. God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ and for his bones unbroken. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to thank you again for joining us today. I want to encourage you to join us in the Fellowship Hall for coffee and treats after the service. Also, if you just need someone to pray with this morning, uh, I'm certainly going to be up here. We have prayer teams on both sides of the sanctuary. If you just want to come and pray with somebody, you can certainly do that. Um, I want to encourage you to just, wherever you're at, return to the Lord. That's what Isaiah 58 is all about. And in the couple of verses before uh, verse 11, which is what we've talked about today, I want to read these verses and encourage you to return to the Lord. It says, he says, "When, when you return to the Lord, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. 
and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you're hurting, if you're broken, if you need healing, return to the Lord, and he will say, Here I am. God bless, and have a wonderful day.